Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, September 8th, 2018. This is episode 1521. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast brought to you by Slack. Slack is a collaboration hub for work that makes sure the right people in your team are always in the loop. And key information is always at their fingertips. Learn more at slack.com. And by WordPress, reach more customers when you build your business website on WordPress.com. Plans start at just $4 a month, and you'll get 15% off any new plan at WordPress.com slash techguy. And by Qualcomm Snapdragon. According to Ookla, Android smartphones with Snapdragon 845 from Qualcomm had faster data speeds on AT&T and T-Mobile than non-Android phones with those Intel modems, based on over a million real-world tests done in Q2 2018. See all the data for yourself at qualcom.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater. We got your digital photography. We got your smartphones. We got your smartwatches. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about all that today, anything with a chip in it. In fact, we are going to talk home theater with Scott Wilkinson in a little bit. Johnny Jett is going to talk about traveling better with technology. Dick D. Bartolo, our giz whiz, our gizmo wizard, will have a gadget or a gizmo. Is he going to do... I, I, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. We'll save it. <laughs> Keep listening later in the show. Um, <laughs> I I think I remember what he's going to do, but we'll save it for later in the show. Let's talk uh, about ARM right now. It's kind of an interesting change in the way technology works over the last couple of months. That is a big deal. You know the name Intel, right? I mean, I got it. I got it right here. You know, you know, you know this sound, right? You, <laughs> you know that sound. Intel, Intel inside. There are even stickers on your computer. It says it's Intel inside. For the last twenty years, maybe even a little bit more, it's been powering. Let's see. I guess Intel powered the first IBM PC. That was nineteen eighty one. So yeah. Almost 30 years, Intel has been powering personal computers. Apple, for a long time, didn't use Intel, but even Apple went to Intel computers, uh, Intel processors a few years ago. They were just totally dominant. And if you go into a network operations center where all the web servers are, they're all running Intel. You know what's not running Intel, for the most part? Your smartphone? Nope. Apple has their own chip design. Android has its own chip design. They're both based on something that's not Intel called ARM. Are you familiar with the ARM microprocessors? ARM is a weird company, an interesting company that doesn't actually make chips. They design chips. It originally ARM was called and it was believe it or not, I don't know if people remember this, the Acorn risk machine because arm was first used in a little computer sold in the uk called the acorn british computer manufacturer acorn computers they developed the risk architecture risk is a different kind of chip design from intel's intel's chip design is cisc the c in cisc stands for complex literally the r in risk spelled the same way except for the r stands for reduced it's a reduced instruction set computer versus a complex instruction set computer. For a long time, CISC ruled the roost. It was faster, more powerful. Yeah, it used more energy, but you could do so much more with it. And that's how Intel kind of dominated. Intel and secondarily AMD, which also makes CISC chips. Meanwhile, in the 80s, ARM was using RISC chips for low-powered computers like the BBC Micro, which a lot was a lot of people in the UK's first computer. It was a very simple, low-power computer, but people, it was their first home computer, they didn't need a lot more. Along comes Apple in the late 80s, and they started working with Acorn to update ARM. Eventually, Apple actually invested in ARM 
And the reason they did it was for a, remember the Newton? It was for a little personal digital appliance. The PDA was the first PDA called the Newton. It had handwriting recognition. This is about 1994. You remember that? I have a few of them right behind me in my computer museum. The Newton was a flop. The handwriting recognition didn't work very well. It was hard to use. And the primary problem the Newton had was there was this new thing in 1994 called the Internet. The Newton wasn't on it. <laughs> But the Newton, in many ways, was the predecessor to the smartphones we use today. And the chip inside it, the ARM chip, ended up owning this mobile market. Apple eventually spun off, sold their stake in ARM. ARM went on and continues to design chips. And as I said, ARM is do completely dominant in mobile. All of Apple's chips are based on the ARM processor to this day. So your A11 and your iPhone or your iPad... Uh, the A12, your, your next iPhone and next iPad, those are ARM-based chips. In Microsoft, I'm sorry, Apple does a lot to change those, to upgrade them, to make them faster. There's a big company out of San Diego you've heard of probably called Qualcomm, also makes ARM chips. Samsung makes its own ARM chips. So lots of companies that make these chips. They license the technology from ARM. As I said, ARM doesn't make chips. Well, lately, uh, ARM has become more and more popular, more and more powerful. People like that low battery thing that, that doesn't use a lot of juice. And Intel has become, well, frankly, a little bit behind Apple, which has been relying on Intel design chips for its Macintosh computers, was hoping to have a, a, a new Intel part, the 10 nanometer size parts by now. They had hoped to redesign their computers around this chip. Intel said, eh, you know what? Eh, we're not going to get those out until late next year, to late 2019. And all of a sudden, the most dominant company in computer hardware, Intel, is starting to look like it might be losing its lead. And look who's coming up behind it. These little low-power risk chips from arm apple's already intimated that it's going to build future macintosh computers not with intel chips but with their own chips that's not confirmed but i think that's probably going to happen in the next few years oh boy that that's a that's a big one other companies like microsoft are looking at arm chips windows now runs on arm microsoft in fact with their latest computer the microsoft go the story is we're planning to make it based on ARM until Intel said, no, please wait, no, don't do that, don't, don't make us cry. And Microsoft relented. And the Wintel, that's what we always call it, Windows and Intel, the Wintel partnership will continue a little bit longer. But with Windows on ARM, with faster ARM processors coming, Windows on ARM offers all-day battery life, all day, not 10 hours, like 20 hours. Uh, offers high-speed connectivity. And one of the things ARM chips, especially the ARM chips from Qualcomm are going to give us, is access to these new high-speed 5G networks. They're starting to look like, hmm, maybe this horse race is starting to change. Maybe Intel's starting to fall back a little bit. Maybe ARM is starting to come on strong. And I, I just thought I'd bring this up because this is about to change, I think, computing dramatically over the next few years. We were already you're already using ARM chips, but on low power, you know, battery powered portable devices, you're going to start seeing those chips. I predict on laptops, first on you know small, lightweight, low powered laptops. Well, we're already seeing them. I have one called the HP NVX2. It's it's nice. It's just a little slow. As as ARM and ARM announced its roadmap by the way uh, last week, and they said we're going to be doing desktop class processors in the next couple of years. You watch. More and more companies will be turning to ARM. Intel, I think, is going to face a really rough time. And you know what? I think it's going to be good for consumers for a couple of reasons. The pressure is on Intel to innovate. That's good. Prices will drop. And we may get some new features, like all-day battery life. I like that. All right, I want to go to the phones. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's get to the phones. Time to take some calls. Starting off with Steve. He's on the line from Arden, North Carolina. Hello, Steve. Hi. Hey, thanks for hanging on. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I stayed awake. 
<laughs> oh, it's easy at the beginning. It's the end of the show where it takes a little a uh, little more effort. What can I do for you? Well, I have a number of computers, and I'm a retired fellow who likes his computers. I generally work in Linux. Uh, oh, nice. I have a number of different uh, laptops. Uh, one's a Chromebook. One's a small Lenovo. Um, one's a, a, a smallish uh, Fujitsu. Um, what I'm missing is, I notice as I get older, that I'd like to have a backlit keyboard on, on my next laptop. Oh, I, and, I'll tell you what. Every laptop, it has to have a backlit keyboard or I'm not going to buy it because I like to compute in bed, in the dark. <laughs> And the the backlit keyboard means I can see the keys. There you go. And I'm just wondering if there's if it's just basically pick any one; they're all the same, or if some are really uh, uh, better than others. If uh, are you uh, do you think now? I often will buy Windows uh, laptops and end up after the first year putting Linux on them. You know that as they kind of g g age out, I put Linux on them. Do you think you're going to run Windows or Linux or maybe Mac? What are, what are you going to do? Well, I haven't done Linux on a Mac. Uh, that's tougher. And I know Mac is is based on um, it's BSD. It's a, it's a Unix, is, yeah, which is a Unix uh, a family. Um, but and we've had an iMac in the past, uh, and we have iPads. But I think I'm I'm primarily thinking of myself as running Linux, whether on a Mac or on Windows. And I'm just narrowly looking at if I look at a new machine. Should I have specific questions about the backlit keyboard? Right. Um, Almost all laptops now have backlit keyboards. It's usually the exception that doesn't. Uh, but I agree with you. That's a, that is one of the things to look at. It's almost the least important compared to things like memory processor, hard drive. And if you do want to run Linux on a machine, uh, it's important to consider how easy it's going to be to put Linux on it. I'm going to say my my recommendation to you, I think you've earned it, you deserve it, is a very nice Lenovo ThinkPad. Uh, they are all backlit. They're very nice hardware. You, the th as long as you get the ThinkPad line. I wouldn't go with the low-end Lenovos, but the ThinkPad line, you're probably familiar with ThinkPads. They've been around for a long time. IBM created them originally. They're built to last. They're easily upgradable and modifiable. Uh, you can often change the trackpad, the keyboard, even the screen, it's easy to do that, to add memory, to change hard drives or add hard drives. And most Linuxes work really nicely out of the box on ThinkPads. That's because a lot of ThinkPad users are Linux developers. So almost always drivers exist for all of the pieces. I recently, I have a year-old Lenovo ThinkPad Yoga, one of the X1, X line, the X-Pad, X1 uh, Yoga, which is a beautiful high-end laptop with no LED screen. And I have enough Windows machines. I thought I'm going to put uh, I'm going to put Arch Linux on this. I want it to be a Linux box. And I was blown away by how easy the install was, and how clean uh, it works. Everything works 100%, including the keyboard backlight, the keyboard button, you know, the function key space to turn on the backlight and change the level. Works right out of the box. It's hardware based, so Linux works fine with it. The only thing that doesn't work is the fingerprint reader. And I'm not surprised because that's a security device and uh, probably is proprietary um, software. And as a result, there isn't a driver for it. But ThinkPad is a great Windows machine, and it's a great Linux machine. Uh, yeah, but I, I agree with you in a sense. Um, in the distant past, I've used uh, ThinkPads. And, um, but my question really is, does that amount to saying when you say that the the backlight is the least important part? Well, um, it's not to you. There are really <laughs> differences to look out for or specs to inquire about if you get well, it. Well, it depends on what you're doing. I, I, you know, I generally don't buy machines with less than 16 gigs of RAM. But you may not need that. I mean, that's so that I can run multi keep things running in the background. I can have many tabs open in my browser, for instance. I often will have uh, my browser open with a number of tabs, my email program running in the background, uh, the programming environment I use running in the foreground. So having more RAM allows you to do that. If you're running Linux in a virtual machine on Windows, of course, then even 16 gigs might not be enough because you have to have a good amount for both operating systems. I, are you running Linux on the metal or are you running it in a virtual machine? 
January, I'm running it in the metal. Okay. In the past, I've run, a, I've run for the hell of it. I've run a few virtual machines. Yeah, virtual machine, then you want more RAM. I think, I think everything you're saying is is very reasonable. And I'm somewhat familiar, partly because I've listened to you a sure. lot. Sure. You've heard me say this. Processor-wise, I think the AMDs are fine. What I'm, what, but I'm back to, what I'm coming back to is the simple question of, um, is there then no difference between something that's a gaming computer, which has, looks like it's designed to have fancy different light combinations, yeah. and a simple business model? There is a difference. There is a difference. Yeah, so there are a few differences. Yeah, the, besides the fancy looks on a gaming machine, usually a gaming machine has a discrete graphics processor, usually right. NVIDIA. And because of the graphics processor and usually a faster CPU as well, like an i7, it will have more elaborate cooling, which often means a bigger case, big vents on the back, sometimes big fans. Unless you're going to be running high-end software that requires all that processor, I, I probably wouldn't buy a gaming machine. Is there? Are you a gamer? Hell no. <laughs> so you don't need the GPU in most cases. Uh, it depends, but there are other programs. I use, I'm a photographer, so I use Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom. Those will use a graphics processor and definitely makes a difference in performance. Um, you know, it's deciding what components to add on a computer really requires some thought about how you're going to use it. For instance, nowadays, Intel, because they couldn't get much faster than 4 gigahertz, solves that problem by having multiple cores. So they have dual core, quad core, even six core laptop processors. Adding more cores means it can do more things at the same time, but often means it has a slower clock speed for any individual core. And since most of what you do requires only one core, sometimes it's better to have fewer cores and a higher clock speed than it is more cores and a lower clock speed. Does that make sense? Right. Well, there are other questions that I might raise, but I mean, when I said what my question was, I didn't want to intrude and take other ones. Well, I mean, it's fun to it's fun to talk uh, about so that some the, of the AMD yeah. uh, with with a graphic chip uh, kind of integrated or with uh, the Vega a combination. Yeah, that's of, a, yeah, that's an interesting. Uh, Intel now makes this weird hybrid processor with AMD graphics built in. That's going to be better than uh, you know the Iris Pro graphics, for instance, that Intel offers on the chip, but not as good as a discrete GPU. So it, but again, you you have to think about: Am do I need a graphics processor? Am I, am I going to be using software that requires a GPU? There's no point in spending money on a GPU, and all the uh, you know associated problems with heat and so forth, unless you're going to use it. Same thing with clock speed. Uh, so it's a very personal decision. But the good news is, in the PC world, there's an infinite number of choices. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Sorry, I had to, I had to finish up there, but did. did, did Oh, and he did too. Main, th you know, any any laptop above a certain price is going to have a backlit keyboard. That's that's kind of a standard in anything. Uh, somebody in the chat room said over a thousand. Yeah, even you know, I mean, I I have Chromebooks with backlit keyboards at three hundred bucks. So just you know, check and see. I am I was blown away by how well the yoga works. Uh, I put Antergos on there, which is a, a arch installer that does all the fiddly bits for you, and it just recognized everything. Worked right out of the box. It was it was amazing. It's one of the nicest Linux computers I've ever owned, and it should be at that price. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's time, my friends, for Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guru. Scott is the editor at AVS Forum and helps us understand better how to get a big screen TV, how to get surround sound, how to get the best sight and sound uh, out of your home theater. Hello, Scott. Hey, Leo. Always a pleasure to see you today. Always happy to be now, here. Now, Scott is a, a certified television calibrator. Am I, I am right? Indeed. Yeah. Yep, that's correct. I got my training from THX, the the company that everyone knows very well for the that famous weird sound at the beginning of some movie. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that was a very poor. This, as you can see, this radio show is not THX. Uh, um, so, but that's but there are other uh, certification groups as well, there, right? There are two. There are two main ones. THX is one. The other one is Image Imaging Science Foundation. Ah. And um, I got an email recently from Chris Hernandez 
uh, who says that he has a he's building a home theater and he's got a pr projector, a BenQ 1080ST, which is a 1080p relatively low cost projector and a 7.1 in-wall speaker setup and a Onkyo receiver and so on and so forth. He hasn't calibrated the BenQ yet, and we're talking about video calibration here. Uh, he's been watching it out of the box, and he says it looks great, but I know it could be better. So I want to I want to calibrate it or have it calibrated. So I want to get a THX or ISF certified tech to calibrate the projector, but he's not been able to find one other than at Best Buy. And he doesn't really have a lot of confidence. You say in that, Best Buy, as if, <laughs> as if they're not a good place to go. Well, I have to tell you, I, I if I if I implied that in my tone of voice, I apologize. No, it's okay if that's if that's what you think. I don't. Well, I have no. Actually, ISF has a contract with Best Buy to train their calibrators. Oh, good. All right. Well, so that's a good sign. It's not a bad thing necessarily. Now, if somebody didn't, you know, do well in the calibration <laughs> class, that's one thing. But um, <laughs> you don't want the C student. You want yeah, the you A want student. The you yeah. want the A student. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, I had so, Scott and our friend Robert Heron of Heron Fidelity uh, do my last uh, TV calibration. So I think I had two A students. You did. Calibrating. I, I, I passed pretty well with that Good. class, and I'm sure Good. Robert did as well. They have to have some hardware, right, to do this? This isn't something oh, you yes, just do by yes. eyeball, right? No, 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 no. Yeah, that's one reason why you probably want to hire somebody, because you need a meter, a, either a colorimeter or a <laughs> spectroradiometer, to measure the light coming off the screen in terms of brightness and in terms of color. And you need some software that will take that data and interpret it and give you information in a form that you can understand and say, oh, the white is too red, so we have to remove some red from the white or ah. whatever it happens to be. Ah. Uh, and so that takes training and it takes equipment and it takes software. Okay. <clears throat> now, he was wondering whether or not, well, he, he didn't know how to find a certified calibrator in his area. And the good news there is you can go to imagingscience.com for the Imaging Science Foundation or to uh, THX.com. And you can look, you can go to there. I think on THX, it's dealers, might be that way on uh, ISF as well. Uh, and you can find people in your area. Just enter your zip code. Oh, good. And you can find people that have been trained and certified and can come over and do it. Uh, now, that will typically cost you several hundred dollars. Uh, at least 250 300 bucks, maybe more, depending on how much you want them to do. If you have a high dynamic range TV, that's going to cost more because they're going to calibrate standard dynamic range and high dynamic range. And so that's obviously going to take longer. Um, so that's if you want to have somebody else do it, that's the way to do it. Now, there are those, particularly among AVS Forum members, who want to do it themselves, who are real geeks like me. Um, so you can go take the training. Uh, there's also an on, sort of an online training course. Um, I should have looked that up before I got on the air here with you. I'll do that real quick. Um, that, uh, that you can do it online. But in any event, you need that equipment. Now, there's, it's not, it doesn't have to be that terribly expensive. For example, uh, you can get a, the, the meter I recommend is called it's from a company called X Right, and it's called the i1 Display Pro, and it costs two hundred and seventy nine bucks. Okay, and it's what's called a colorimeter, and it it it's faster than a spectroradiometer, but you have to make sure that it's profiled properly for your TV, and the software that comes with it contains basic profiles, so you probably should be fine. Then you need some calibration software. And the software I recommend and that I use is from a company called uh, Portrait Display. They're a subsidiary. They just bought recently a company called SpectraCal, which makes CalMan. And that's the name of the software. There's the home enthusiast version of CalMan for 399 bucks. But that's what you use, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's exactly what I use. Yeah. And it gives you all the capabilities you need to calibrate uh, your TV yourself. So that plus the 279 for the iWrite i1 Display Pro 
uh, you're at about almost 700 bucks. How much did it cost to go to school for this? Oh, the training is a couple of grand. Wow. So now you understand why you got to pay these guys to come into your house and do this. Exactly. How much? Now, well, uh, the, again, bringing somebody into your house to do it, bringing a pro in is going to be between three and 500 bucks. But do you think you could do it yourself if you wanted to? If, if you if want you to spend the, 700 bucks on the equipment. <laughs> on the equipment and you want to you want to go and do the training. Yeah. Um, now. Um, you really need the training, you're saying. You really do. That it's. It is not a, a simple, obvious thing. You really need to know what you're doing. Because I've looked, you know, so, and, and we've talked about this before, but I purchased the discs. The cal There are a number of different calibration discs you can buy mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. and eyeballed it. And, you know, this is, is this, uh, is this the, you know, what's the darkest you can see and things like that. And is this sure, white? Sure. And, you know, and, and so that feels like it gets me pretty close or it does, does it? It does. It does. It does. And that's that's very important. If you buy a disc like Disney Wow or uh, Digital Video Essentials HD that's, Basic. That's the one I have. Digital Video yeah. Essentials. DVE. Yeah. DVE. Right. Uh, and you set your five basic user controls. You don't need training for this. Disney Wow will take you through it step by step. Yeah. Uh, you set your basic user controls, which are brightness, contrast, color, tint and sharpness. Right. You don't need any equipment. All you need is that twenty or thirty dollar disc. You will get seventy to eighty percent of the way to a perfectly calibrated TV. And if you have an inexpensive TV, that's what I recommend. Don't spend the so three maybe or that four or that BenQ that's that's uh, appropriate, right? It may very well be appropriate. Yeah. I forget how much that BenQ is, but it's not very much. It's probably a thousand bucks, right? Maybe less. Um, and so yes, doing it that way. It based, that's a, called a user setup as opposed to a calibration. A full calibration is you use the meter, you use the software, or you hire somebody to do it. It costs you hundreds of dollars. Is it worth it that much to get the extra 20% of the way to the absolute best that TV or display can do? If the display is expensive enough, yes. If it's inexpensive, no, I don't think it's. I don't think it's so worth the it. The Disney Wow for Blu-ray is fifty bucks. It's not cheap. Oh, is it? They, it went up since the last time. Yeah. I saw Yeah. I mean, maybe huh. this is. I'm looking on Amazon, so maybe that's they're, the Blu-ray. Yeah, that's the Blu-ray. You can get the DVD for sixteen hundred, sixteen bucks. But that's no. I you want I'd the Blu-ray, Blu right? Because yeah. if you're going to do a Blu-ray, you absolutely want the Blu-ray. Okay. By the way, an online training for calibration. If you really want to go through it, go to T L V E X P. Dot CA. It's a Canadian guy, Michael Chen, excellent calibrator, TLVEXP.ca. And it, it we'll costs you that, something, we'll but put, not nearly as we'll much. We'll put that in the show notes. And of course, if you want to see Scott, go to avsforum.com. Thank you, Scott. Pat. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're talking about computers, the internet, home theater, and we're taking your calls. And it's John in Winthrop, Massachusetts is next. Hi, John. Hi, Leo. Thanks for calling. Thank you. I have a question for you on the Google universe. Actually, yes. a couple questions. Yes. Uh, my first one, you're probably aware of the Samsung just came out with their Galaxy Tab S4. Yes. Very nice, yeah. huh? Very nice. And what I use a tablet for personally is uh, content watching like movies. Yep. And as far as I know, it's the only tablet with an OLED screen. I think that makes such a difference. Yeah. And because I'm using it primarily for watching movies, I figured it would be better than the uh, the iPad. Uh, the iPad, I, iPad's an LCD, but it's a very good LCD. Of course, Apple uh, spends a lot of money to make sure those LCDs are tuned, calibrated. Uh, they have that true tone feature, which on the pros anyway, which senses the ambient light and slightly modifies the color of the screen, so it 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 you know looks more realistic. On the other hand, nothing beats an OLED. I yeah. have an OLED on my. I was talking about the Yoga earlier this hour. Uh, the Yoga uh, laptop. There was a big pricey feature, but man, when you look at it, and I agree with you for watching movies, it's. You might. I don't know if the Samsung S4 does HDR. Does it? Did they say? Uh, yeah, it, it does HDR and uh, Dolby, um, Dolby Atmos. I haven't heard the speakers uh, yet. Dolby Atmos, when it comes to phones and tablets, is kind of 
a gimmick. Yeah. It's really, they've licensed the name. Dolby is selling the name. You know, Atmos implies a certain quality of sound, including up speakers up above you. There's no way a tablet or a phone can do that. Right. So it's just, you know, it's an... <laughs> It's a certification. Sometimes I know I have one phone that requires you pay for and download a Dolby Atmos app to get the built-in Dolby Atmos sound. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> if you wear headphones, maybe, maybe. Uh, are you going to wear headphones with it? No, because um, I find them uncomfortable. Yeah. But, uh, the problem so I have you with... You want good the speakers then, and I haven't heard the S4 speakers yet, so I, don't, I can't vouch for those. The issue with the, the Samson Galaxy Tab S4 is now that later in the month, Google is coming out with their Android P. I heard it's a myth, maybe, but they will not be supporting tablets anymore, Android tablets. Yeah. Google, Google stopped making the, uh, the C, the Pixel C, that, that was a very nice tablet. But the problem was that Android and tablets don't really go together very well. None of the, none of the apps really support that larger screen. I think... The S series, the Samsung S series, has really been very good for Android tablets. And I think also the fact that they're now allowing Android apps on uh, Chrome OS, on Chromebooks, means that more and more Android developers will think of screen size as, a, as, as unpredictable. And so will do this, the right thing, make their, make their app work on a variety of different screen aspect ratios and sizes. So my sense is that the tablet uh, world will get better for Android, whether Google supports it or not so i you know when you buy a samsung device you're really buying samsung's version of android you're not buying google's version of android so i wouldn't worry about that too much samsung is making these tablets they're they're clearly committed to this category so they're going to make sure touch whiz and the samsung interface work work well on tablets i think they do a pretty good job you know i mean at that price they're the same price as an ipad yeah at that price you know the the difference is in the iPad that there is huge support for iPad, and the software variety on iPad is amazing. And because iPads sell so well, and there's so many of out out there, especially compared to Android tablets, there is better tablet support on iOS. I think. And you don't think the new iPads coming out will be shipped with OLEDs, do you? That's an interesting question. You know, the OLEDs are made by Samsung and LG, so Samsung has had OLED screens on their phones for a lot longer than Apple has, for instance. I don't, I don't know what Apple is going to do when they announce the new iPads, and I, so I just don't know yeah. if they'll be OLED. They have them on the, the iPhone 10 has an OLED. Yeah, it's the first OLED Apple's ever used, and they buy them from Samsung and LG. So um, you know, they're trying to get other companies to make them. My guess is no. Apple's Apple's position is no. Our LCDs are great, and they are. They really are. Um, have you seen them side by side? The, I uh, haven't. Uh, I have. I have. As I said, I have a Lenovo ThinkPad with an OLED screen, and it definitely. So OLED. It's interesting. OLED isn't as accurate, maybe. Okay, yeah. uh, because uh, it, it tends to be, especially the way Samsung tunes their OLEDs. They tend to be overly saturated, overly rich. They want to emphasize the you know, the poppiness of the screen. I love that look, uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker might say, well, that's not true to my design. Right. I don't know. I think HDR is going to make a difference, and OLEDs can really do that. The, the darkest darks and the, the difference between the darkest darks and the brightest whites is dramatic, and I think that's going to make a big difference all by itself. So I can, yeah, if, if, all, if what your number one issue is, I want the best screen, get the S4 for sure. Yeah. Will you have a review model? Yes. Yeah. So we'll 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 tell you, but uh, that may be not till you know when I get back from vacation. So I'm thinking maybe October. Yeah. So don't wait. Just get it. <laughs> Go look at it. You'll be able to look at it a lot of places. Yeah, it comes in white too, which I like. Yeah. Uh, I mean, software. It depends. You know, if you said, "Look, all I'm going to be doing is watching Amazon Prime and Netflix," then you don't care if the software is better on yeah, the iPad. I don't, yeah. Right. And it, it could. I think it comes with Dex too. You know that. Uh, yeah. Desktop. But, yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing. I don't. So Dex is a little puck <laughs> that allows you to hook up a full size screen and keyboard to it. But again, Android's not really tuned for that kind of stuff. So right. Samsung right. has done a lot to make it work. I, I have a Dex, uh, which I use with my S nine. It's and I used it with the Note eight before. It. It's interesting. I don't. It's not a. It's not. It's not quite Chrome OS, but I it's, a, it's a, a selling point. 
I just wanted to bring up this last point before I let you go sure. on uh, the caller before me. You kind of answered my question, but I just want to review that uh, sometimes it's better for a processor to have less cores at a higher base clock than That's more right. cores. Well, the Acer makes some fabulous uh, Chrome OS devices, and they have a new device, the CXI3, yeah. which is the most powerful Chrome OS device you can buy. It's going to come with uh, an i7 quad core. Whoa! 16 gigabytes of RAM, DDR4. So this is a desktop. They call it a this, Chrome box. Right, and this is the i7. It's a, the eighth generation Intel. I, I think that sounds amazing. I don't know if you need all that processor for Chrome OS. Well, I was thinking when uh, when the, the Linux apps sh start going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe you would. Maybe you yeah. would. That's a, an, How much are they charging for the CX3? The CX3 is 759 Yeah, so it's like a computer. Yeah, and the CXI3 with the uh, i3, 8th uh, generation, is a dual-core 2.7 gigahertz. See, I think that would be plenty. Yeah, with 8 gigs of RAM. That would be plenty. That's RAM is important on Chrome OS because you're going to use Chrome, which is a pig, and every tab is going to take RAM. So I have noted that uh, Chrome OS on 4 gigs is a little bit sluggish, much better with 8 or even 16. That would be my recommendation. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's see. Let's take another call before the top of the hour. On the line here, line two is Ron in Downey, California. Hi, Ron. Hello, Ron. To do Ron, Ron. To do Ron, Ron. All right. I, I'm going to put Ron on hold because I think he has <laughs> happened sometimes. He fell asleep. So we'll uh, let's see here. I have to push this button and this button, and then magically he goes on hold. Uh, it's all right. We're going to take a break anyway for news at the top of the hour. Johnny Jet coming up next hour, our travel guy. And, yeah, we'll do another one of those. I don't know if you heard this last weekend. Uh, these uh, bits we're doing with my friend Adam Fisher. His book, Valley of Genius, is interviews with some of the most important people in Silicon Valley history, some of the pioneers and even some of the more recent people. And, He's going to come back, and we'll have some more audio from us from a, a, a Silicon Valley guru, genius. That's coming up, too. A lot more fun and a lot more calls. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And don't forget the website. We put all the answers, all the links at techguylabs.com. We'll have more of the uh, Tech Guy show in just a bit. I want to tell you about our sponsor, the people who make this podcast possible, in more ways than one. Not just by not just by advertising, but really we organize everything we do at Twit and the podcast network with Slack. I love Slack. Can I say it out loud now? So for a long time, we were a hip chat house. We use all the Atlassian products. And when I heard that Slack bought hip chat, I was jumping for joy. I said, finally... <laughs> Finally, I can use Slack again. We'd used it for a while uh, when we were doing our website, and I just I fell in love with it. It's clean, it's easy, it's fast. It integrates with all the tools we use, including uh, Atlassian Jira and Confluence. We use that with our Google Apps. We use those heavily. It all works. Slack is the way to, it's better than email. It's the way for teams to work together. It's a collaboration hub for whatever work you do. With Slack, the right people in your team are kept in the loop. The information they need is always there. Teamwork on Slack happens in channels, letting you organize conversations and information around projects, offices, and teams. You know, we have Slack teams for editorial, for ops, uh, for each show. It's a great way to stay in touch with each other. I, <laughs> you know who else is happy about this? Megan and Jason, they were using Slack behind my back. <laughs> Because they like it so much. Now they can come out and, in the open and say, yeah, 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 we like Slack. Everything you need uh, to get work done is in one place. It's faster, it's easier, especially if, like me, you're not always in the office or are on vacation as I am now. It connects the tools and services and the information I need all in one place. It's easy to use. I have it on my Android phone, on my iOS phone. You can use it on the desktop. And we use so many uh, tools that integrate easily with Slack. Over a 1,000 apps work with Slack. It really is the, the premier product in this category. You don't have to search through emails for that f one follow-up or multiple systems to find what you're looking for. Your entire workflow is there in Slack, including Jira, Salesforce, Zendesk, Google Drive, and much, much more. We use Panopto with this. We use a ton of stuff with uh, integrated in Slack, and it's great. With mobile apps, 
You can always pick up where you left off no matter where you are. Your team is just better connected with Slack. Learn more at Slack.com. We love them. So glad to be in the Slack family. Slack.com. We thank Slack for their support. Now back to the show. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, hey, hey. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We talk about smartphones, smart watches. Don't ask me when the iPhone event will be. I don't know. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Probably uh, Wednesday, right? Right? Yeah. Uh, but we can talk about anything else. In fact, on the line right now, joining me on the line, Paul in Sun Valley, California. Hello, Paul. Hello, Leo. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. I've got a two-part question I'm hoping that you can help me with. Um, the first is I use DSL reports, and I check my speed and everything, but there's a grade that I always get an F on, and that's buffer bloat. <laughs> me too. I always get an F on buffer bloat too. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> yeah, you can pretty much ignore it. So here's the problem. Uh, <laughs> uh Router manufacturers, uh, when RAM got fairly cheap, you know, there's a buffer in your in your router that's yes. that it, you. Uh, in fact, your computer's full of buffers. The whole idea of a buffer is it's a little uh, storage pool that when stuff's coming in, it stores it there and then passes it along, and that gives you a little uh, resiliency if the connection is wonky or whatever. There's a buffer, a small RAM buffer, in your router. And the problem was when RAM got cheap a few years ago, router manufacturers thought, oh, we'll just put more in. That's the buffer, and it got bloated. By putting more in, they actually made your traffic slower because uh, uh, the size of the buffer actually screwed up <coughs> things that were making assumptions. It's complicated. You can actually Google uh, buffer blow to read the Wikipedia article. It's a fairly high technical thing. In my opinion, overrated, overrated. And modern routers seem to on the, I love this DSL speed report, DSL uh, uh, or broadbandreport.com and do the speed test. It's the best speed test out there. It's very good. But I think that you can ignore that buffer bloat. Okay, because they tell, tell you to buy a router called Q router. Well, that's just an ad. At that point, uh, do they really? They say, "Oh, you need to replace your router with a Q router." Yes. No, that's just an ad. I don't. That's uh, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. I'll have to go check the website. Uh, there are plenty of low buffer bloat, bloat routers out there because once router manufacturers learned about this, it ha it's an interaction with the way TCP works and the size of the buffer. Uh, I notice nobody's shrunk the size of the buffer, but there are other things that they can do. Um, if you want a second opinion, it's a really um, good program I, I uh, recommend that will not try to sell you something called Netalyzer from ICSI. This is a uh, study going on at the University of California at Berkeley. N-A-T-A-L-Y-Z-R. You can Google it. It's a jo The only negative is a Java app. So if you don't have Java installed, and I, by the way, don't recommend you install it. But if you happen to have Java, you can run this thing. It'll give you a much more accurate representation of what's going on with buffer blow and other things. I rarely get anything better than a C or a D on any of my excellent routers. I think it's overblown. The buffer bloat is bloated. Okay. Okay. And then my sec can I have time for a second? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I've got a um, program that needs Windows 7, and I upgraded to Windows 10 already. Is there a place, a reputable place, that I can buy a good copy of Windows 7? Preferably, you know, um, still in the box? There is a... Um, so this program will not run at all on Windows 10, it says. Yeah. Correct. Is there still a compatibility mode? Is there a way to right-click on the icon and say, run as if you're in Windows 7? Sometimes there is, and that will... It just... It merely tricks the computer. So what happens is, very often, the program will run fine in Windows 10, but it was written before Windows 10 came out. 
And mm -hmm. so the program says, well, if it's if it's less than Windows 7, don't run. But it gets confused by Windows 1.0. <laughs> and it thinks that Windows 1.0 is less than 7 somehow. And you can ignore it. So the compatibility mode basically tricks it. Windows 10 compatibility mode. Let me see how you turn this on. Um, if you uh, hit the Windows key and you search for run programs made for previous versions of Windows, just type mm -hmm. the first few letters of that. You'll find a control panel, the Program Compatibility Troubleshooter. See if you can get that Windows 7 program to run. That would be by far the preferable thing to do. And in most cases, all it does is say, yeah, I'm Windows 7, yeah. And the program goes, oh, fine, and runs. Because it's not that it's incompatible. It's just that it, it's not checking properly for Windows 7. If you really do need Windows 7, you asked an interesting question. Where can I get, a, you know, what's a reliable source? The only really reliable source is Microsoft. However... You go on eBay, you'll see a lot of people selling Windows 7 OEM discs and all sorts of kinds of discs. I'd be really nervous about that. I, some, yeah, some yeah of, I am too. Yeah, some of them absolutely are up on the up and up. Some of them aren't. Newegg may... Let me just see if Newegg's still selling uh, OEM versions of Windows 7. They were for a long time, and they're certainly reliable. Um, yeah, they still sell Windows 7. Um, yeah. It's not cheap. But uh, 99 bucks for Windows Home Premium, mm -hmm. that's not too bad. That's the cheapest one I see there. And since you're getting it from Newegg, you're safe. It's, it's mm -hmm. the OEM version. Actually, what's happened, it looks to me like what happens here is that they give you a serial number and then you download it from Microsoft, which would be the, the safest way to do this. Mm -hmm. It means you're not getting the discount you'd like. If you look on eBay, I'm sure there's $30 and $40 versions. Yeah, but I don't want to take a chance. Yeah, I don't blame you. So first try to uh, see if the compatibility uh, checker will fix the problem. That's the best thing to do. Okay. That's the ideal okay. thing. To do. In most in almost every case it will. <clears throat> I can't think of a reason why a program would run on Windows 7 but not run on Windows 10. There are very few things Microsoft lives and breathes and dies for <laughs> downward compatibility, compatibility with what they call legacy software. That's all it cares about. They do everything they can to make sure your older software will run on newer versions of Windows. <clears throat> it's something that's that runs fine on Windows 7 should probably run on Windows 10. It's just it's just that these older programs don't always do the right thing when they're checking versions. <clears throat> Let me just uh, Chumley's giving me the link to the official uh, download for Windows 7 from Microsoft. Let me just see what. Uh... Yeah, you need a product key. See, that's the thing. So you can. Oh, here's the other thing you could do. <laughs> you can download it and use it. It'll work fine for a while. Then after 30 days or 60 days, it'll start saying, you need a serial number. You got to give me a serial. I'm... And then it'll start slowing down. But it'll work for a while. And I suppose you could uninstall it and reinstall it. It would start the whole thing over again. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, eBay has Windows 7 for 35 bucks, but <laughs> look at the reviews of the seller, you know? I mean, a lot of times what happens is that uh, these are disks that were included in a PC or something and never used. What you really want to worry about and watch out for, there's two things. Obviously, the big one is malware, but most of the time, if that's a disk with the Windows hologram and, and everything, it isn't dangerous. The serial number, though, might have already been used. And that's really where what most often, I think, happens on eBay. You buy the disk. They can sell the disk, but the disk is useless to you without a serial number. You install it. It says, oh, I see the, ser you, you, the serial number is on the disk. You enter it in. It says, no, no, this has already been used. That's the more likely scam. Not malware, just, hey, it's you can't use it. It's already been used. So you may have to spend the 99 bucks if you really need to run Windows 7. I do that. I buy uh, Windows... I periodically will buy the old version of Windows for virtual machines. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, we're going to get some more calls in just a bit. Hey, 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 Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We go back to the phones line three. Stuart, somewhere in Southern California. Hello, Stuart. Hello, Leo. Thanks for calling. Long time listener from the screensaver days. Wow, that's a viewer. 
Nice. Yes. Yes. The old uh, 20 year old now tech TV show we did. <laughs> I, I am an old man, I tell you, 20 years ago. I wasn't a young guy when, I, when we started it. But it was a lot of fun. You know, I talked to somebody the other day, and I wonder if this is your experience, who watched the screensavers who said, I think he was, he was in a small town in the Midwest, and he said, it was just great for me in 1998 to know that I wasn't the only geek in the world. It was, exactly. It was early enough that, you know, you didn't... Nowadays, we all know there's plenty of geeks in the world. <laughs> Some of the richest people in the world. What can, what can I do for you? <laughs> I am a longtime user of Ghost. Norton Ghost. Man, do they don't make and, that anymore, and I, do they? And, and I know they don't make that anymore, no. even though I have an old copy of it. Wow. There's I, a, I don't throw anything away. There's a blast from the past. But I have a Lenovo laptop that I need to make a bootable hard drive with my new solid state drive. Okay. And I need to know where to go with that. Yeah, well, so almost always when you buy a new drive, and this is really true of the solid states, uh, the company that sells the drive will offer a uh, sector copying utility that will allow you to make a bit for bit copy of the original. So you just blast it on using that tool. Now the trick to do that of course is somehow you've got to get the old drive and the new drive running on the same machine. That's uh, not a problem. Okay. <laughs> if, if you have a tower for instance it's easy enough to install the new drive and, uh, and boot up to the old drive and then run one of these programs. Western Digital makes one, uh, Hitachi makes one, Seagate makes one. Just usually, if you just go to their website, they sometimes they call them drive tools, things like that. Uh, and you can so you don't have to buy anything. You just and it's a little different than a ghost utility because you want to copy everything, including the master boot record. You want to basically a sector by sector copy that doesn't pay attention to the file system or anything. It's just saying sector one on this drive, sector one on that drive, sector one on this, two on this drive, sector two on that drive. That kind of thing. That's how you get a bit, bit for bit copy. Exactly. Yep. So, uh, Jeff, first thing to do is, uh, who, who's uh, how are you how are you choosing the SSD? Where are you getting it? Um, picked it up at Fry's. It's a Western Digital. Okay, yeah, go to the Western Digital, get their Western Digital tools, uh, and it'll it'll uh, automatically recognize the drive, and uh, and do it. And you know, I don't think these are the fanciest uh, programs out there, but this, you don't need anything too fancy. You're not going to use it forever. You're just going to use it once. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And then there are, you know, we've mentioned this before, there are clone utilities that will do this, lots of them. Uh, I like the idea of doing kind of, the clone utilities are operating system uh, and file system aware. So they make some judgment calls about what to copy, what not to copy. I like these sector by sector copiers. They're dumber, but that's what you kind of what you want. You don't want them to be thinking about... Uh, you know what they're copying. You just want them to. You just want. Okay. Uh, I think if you go to support.wdc.com, you'll see a link for the uh, Western Digital Drive utilities. I think that's that's what you uh, that's what you need. I think it looks like they offer a True Image as well. That's interesting. So they offer some free uh, tools. Uh, wow, they've actually. I'm looking at it now. They've really beefed up their. Uh, their tool list of this stuff. But if, I think if you get the WD Drive utilities for Windows, that'll do exactly what you want. 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number. If I'm wrong, you can call me. Or better yet, go to the website, techilabs.com, and leave comments. Uh, the site is free. It's open to anyone. Uh, it's got a great search. And we, we put that comment section up there for precisely this reason, because yelling at the radio is so ineffective. Line one, John Dana Point. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, John. Hi. I have a Lenovo Flex 5, and I went ahead and changed the pin on it. I inserted special characters into it, think, uh -oh. thinking that if they didn't like it, they would refuse it. Uh-oh. They yes, uh-oh, <laughs> that it did accept it, which is surprising because I thought they would have it set to reject anything but numbers. Yeah, one would think. But they didn't. And it has flummoxed everything. Oh, no! How oh, it refuses. <laughs> it insists on having a pen, which it won't accept. It refuses to let me use my registered fingerprint or my password. So you can't 
use your Microsoft? Did you set it up with a Microsoft account in the beginning? I yes, but I can't do anything. It will not accept that. It gives three options uh, on that: use the PIN, the registered fingerprint, or the uh, password. None of which they will accept. Oh boy! Now usually there's a recovery option on that screen that says log in to your Microsoft account for recovery. You don't. It doesn't offer that. It doesn't offer that. No, I got this through Costco. It was a good deal. It has the uh, 512 SSD and the one terabyte uh, spinner, yeah. which has been just fine. I really like that, but now uh, it's one of those things where uh, no good deal goes, good deed goes unpunished. Yeah, there is, uh, at least last when time I, I set up Windows 10, I remember it saying you can use... Uh, you can, pins are normally dig numbers only, but they say if you click this box, if you want to use something besides numbers. Well, I talked to Lenovo's uh, service people, and their answer was send it in, and we'll replace the motherboard. Oh no 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 <laughs> no no no! Okay. Why would they say it that? Is. According to the reviews I've seen online, that seems to be their standard rejoinder. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, no, you should be able to, um, have you tried completely shutting it down and logging and from the beginning yeah. logging? And it, and it still says those are the three options. They don't give you an option to use your Microsoft account because normally that's the recovery system is, oh, well, log in with your Microsoft account and you can reset all of this stuff. Unfortunately. <laughs> I think Lenovo's answer is wrong, but I don't necessarily have a better answer for you because I'm baffled that you're not seeing this option to do something else. Well, I do have it backed up. That's the good news. Oh, good. All right. But um, I really don't want to nuke it if I don't have to. No, I don't think you do. Um, this is an interesting question. And I'm not even sure if I could even do that given the fact it won't let me log in. So I... I, so I, 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 I don't think Lenovo's done something dumb. I am befuddled as to why they wouldn't... Yeah, this isn't... Well, it's not normal behavior. I've never seen this happen. I've You know, if you couldn't remember the pin, it should say, rec you know, recover by logging into your Microsoft account. I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know uh, what's going on here, and I don't have a... A uh, fix for you and only have a few seconds before we have to take a break. Okay, quick question. Is there a way I can go ahead and uh, reformat the drive? Even hang hang on a little bit. We're going to take a break and let me see if I can I can help you uh, off the air. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, because I don't want to leave you hanging on that. Um, Frustrating. That is, yeah. And it doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem right. Especially since Lenovo didn't I mean, why didn't they check the attributes to if they want only study? right? They shouldn't let you enter something you can't use. That's basically and, and like and like any smart monkey, you thought, well, I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> well, my point was that if you if you use the equivalent of a dictionary attack on on a pin, you only have ten numbers, and if you uh, let somebody crank away on it long yeah, enough, yeah, yeah. Um, so who expects? A special character in a pin. Can you? I think if you had another computer and you could, do you have another Windows PC lying around, or can you use somebody's? Yes, I have an HP DV6. Okay. Which log is into that Windows account. I presume you use the same Windows account for both machines. Correct. So log into that Windows account on the HP. Do it on the web. Um, oh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So you go to Microsoft.com, and you can sign into your Microsoft account. Microsoft account on the other one. Okay, sure. And make sure first that your Microsoft account's working, because that's my, my chief concern is that... It is. I just reset. I used. I have a Samsung Note 8, which I love because of the stylus. I would never willingly go back to one without it. Uh, but I use that to reset my Microsoft account. Okay, good. So you know your Microsoft login's working. Correct. Normally, <laughs> on Windows 10, if you forget your local account password or your, or your fingerprint stops working, your pin stops working, you can recover uh, 
by logging into your Microsoft account. So I'm baffled that this isn't isn't working, and that's that's the thing that I, I make sure you're not missing somewhere on this on the screen. No, I I it's a beautiful screen. I really like it, but unfortunately, it only offers those three options. And if I try the pin too many times, then it goes to where well, you have to type in A one B two C three. Yeah. And if you do it too many more times, it delays you. You know, standard security stuff. But it will never, ever accept that. And if I try the other two options, those don't work either. So it's uh, my only thought is, well, I'm, w I'm willing to, to format this if that's what it takes. But if I can't get into it at all... No, no you can get into it. I, let me, I'm just going to quickly on my Windows computer log in here or, or pretend like okay i'm covering up the because i have the unfortunately i have the windows hello so it's gonna it's looking for me but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna use that system to log in now let's see if i uh, try to log in with my pin oh man come on i don't want i don't want the uh... so if you okay so Bleep Blurp has a good suggestion. I, this used to work, and I guess it still works on Windows 10. If you log into safe mode, you can enable the administrator's account and log in that way. And then once you're in the administrator's account, you reset that user's PIN to uh, something simple. Okay, well, unfortunately, what Lenovo has done in its wisdom is that they started this out with an administrator mode only, and I haven't had time yet to set up uh, a oh, so when you got it, it oh, this is interesting. When you got it, and they didn't tell me it was it set was up set up as an there was an account already set up. You didn't create a new account. No, that that uh, uh, it already had Windows Ten on it, and it was. This an is the problem: is now you are not running it on your Microsoft account. That's why now I understand you didn't bother to create an account. It was already set up with an account. Correct. Ah, all right. <laughs> there is still, a, I think, there's still a hidden administrator account. Uh, what is the name that you log into this computer with then? Administrator? No, it never said I was administrator. I just set up a standard when I registered with it. I just set up my username and password, and it never told me it was an administrator account. And in uh, in my HP with Windows 10, uh, naturally. All right. Chat room, help me out here. How does he so so log to turn off the machine? Log in, pressing F eight to get into the safe mode thing. And they say there is a way to enable a hidden account called administrator. So PC guy eighty eight, walk me through this so that we can help him here. Um. Uh, so so you start in. Um, yeah, you can have multiple administrator accounts. That's not a problem. But what we want is the hidden administrator account that has no password. Because if you can get into that, then you can reset the other administrator account's password. So uh, help me out here. Okay, I just tried that, pressing F8, uh, turn it off, press 8, turn it on, keeping F8 pressed. And it came back to the original window again. In other words, it did not open in safe mode. Yeah. Um, ghacks.net. Now that's old, though. PC guy, is that still a? That's a 2014 article. PC guy, is it still the case? Is it still going to work? Let me look at how to enable it. This is for older. This is for Windows 7. If you're on the line, still hang on. I'm going to take some more calls in a second, but I'm just uh, trying to. I very much appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you Google how to enable the hidden administrator account, if you Google that, you can still... Uh, how to Geek has a good article on it. This is probably the right one. Um, oh, first you'll... Uh, this is not good. See, the problem with going online and researching, you have a lot of people putting stuff on there that don't... I know, I know. How to Geek is reliable. How do you separate the wheat from? Yeah, the I know completely, but uh, How to Geek is reliable. Okay. Um, however, I don't. The way they're describing it requires you have access to the command prompt, which you don't have. 
So in other words, this is something you would do before you lose access to the system. Um, I do have my my uh, recovery USB I made before I ever started. Any oh, all right. Well, that also has a password recovery built into it. Run that. Boot to that. Okay. And there is a password recovery routine in that. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. If you've got that, I think you're okay. Okay. I... I I looked at that and I thought, well, if I nuke it, I can just, you know, go ahead and recover it that way, plus my backup. That, uh, but uh, it's uh, more than a bit frustrating that Lenovo would. It's even very odd, yeah. And they they've done on, something strange to the system. I think everybody should get online and yell at Lenovo. Yeah. I buy their ThinkPads only. I don't buy any other of their machines because the ThinkPad group is an independent group, and they would never tolerate that nonsense. <laughs> Believe it or not, in their uh, system, this is listed as a ThinkPad, not oh. a ThinkPad. Oh. Uh, it's, it's really puzzling, but there you are. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have much of a solution for you. I apologize. Okay, how about half a stick of dynamite? <laughs> you shouldn't have to uh, do to change the motherboard unless they've put a firmware uh, lock, you know, a password to lock. I think that's what whoever you were talking to didn't understand what you were asking. If you had a, a, a lock on the firmware, password on the firmware, and you'd forgotten it, then you'd need to do something more extreme. But all you've forgotten is your password to your account. Um, yeah, well... There's one other thing that may have some function on this. I don't think it has anything to do with the password, though. But the uh, charging on this system, even if even when it was working, and I would put the cursor on the little battery indicator, mm -hmm. a connected but not charging. And that was uh, maybe what they wanted to do to replace the motherboard, too. No, that's normal. It just connected but not charging means there's not enough juice coming from that. Well, this is this it works just fine on my. Uh, this is using their adapter on a plug-in straight into the wall. Hmm. That's, that maybe that that is an issue. Yeah, that should that's not. Uh, their adapter should give you enough uh, wattage to charge it. Obviously. Right. I wish it was a longer cord like the HP DV6 did, but yeah. it, oh, there you go. Um. Yeah, I mean, if I had access to the machine, I would. I think we could probably fix this. Uh, it's hard for me from a distance to figure out exactly. Can I ship it to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, the chat room seems to have a lot of suggestions, but I think there's a lot of questions as well. Try, get into safe mode first. Yeah, see. that's the problem. If it won't let me... The safe mode. It should let you, unless there's some other password protection. Up, go to F8, press and hold down. Well, F8. let's see. Uh, let me see where safe mode. Um, Lenovo. And that doesn't have any effect. It just comes back to the same. It's Windows 10, right? Right. 64. That's right. Windows 10 doesn't have a safe mode anymore. Oh, okay. Well, that answers the question then. Okay. Um, so there is a command that will enable that. Uh, you need to get to a command prompt. And uh, so I think you it's good you have the recovery thing. Do the recovery thing. See if there, uh, there should be a password recovery in there. If there's not, then there is a command that will enable the built-in elevated administrator account. It's a, it's a, it's, I'll tell you the command, but probably better if you search for this uh, on the, on the web, but you can get in a command line from that recovery disk and then type net space, user space, capital administrator space. Wait a minute. Okay, well, net, I don't, net, yeah, I don't want you, I don't want to dictate it to you. You'll find this, go, use the other computer and just search for uh, enabling the hidden administrator account on Windows 10. All right, will do. Because, uh, yeah, I don't want you to type it wrong and screw anything up. Okay. All right. Good luck. Is now. Thank you, Larry. All right. Chat room's been very active with this one. They love this one. Uh, and I'm just puzzled by the behavior on on the machine. There should still be a way to uh, 
log in via your Microsoft account. That's what I don't understand. Maybe he never set up a Microsoft account on this, right? Shift F F10 after booting from the recovery. Shift F10 after booting from recovery. All right. He's been everywhere, man. He's Johnny Jet. He's breathing the mountain air. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, John. <laughs> hey, Johnny Jet, <laughs> our traveling guy. Johnny is a, what do you call yourself? A travel influencer? Well, you know, that's what, that's the new um, buzzword. You know, a, a few months ago, it was a travel blogger. I consider myself a travel publisher because I've had a website, you know, I started, I started back in 1995. I started my newsletter, my website in 99. What? And I, they didn't even and have, I have websites practically. Holy cow. Yeah. So I, I mean, and blogging came out in 2004 uh, and now influencer is the big word. I have a difficult time saying, Hey, I'm a travel influencer. But I just consider myself a travel enthusiast and a publisher. You know, when I, when I hear travel influencer, I don't think of you. I think of a young woman, attractive young woman, who has an Instagram account with more than a million followers, who uses it to get free hotel rooms all around the world. <laughs> and I've seen articles on how to do this. And there yeah. are at least a dozen of these people. Um, yeah. They all turn out to be attractive young women for some reason. And hotels, you tell me, you must run into them. Hotels, yeah. cruise lines, everywhere. They just, they say, oh, yeah, if you'll put some Instagram pictures up, please stay stay at our beautiful hotel. Yeah, it's actually, it's not just uh, attractive women, although. Good looking guys. Yeah, they don't even have to be that good looking. Although, <laughs> actually, I don't want to brag on my buddy. I was just with a guy on a uh, trip the other day. His Jeffrey the Pilot on Instagram. He has 200,000 followers and he, um, you know, he his niche is aviation geeks. Right. And, well, that makes and sense. Knew, and I sat next to him on the plane. We did this flight on Embraer, and he knew every plane at the airport. I'm talking yeah, like, yeah. you know, the FedEx planes, the little ones, these little puddle jumpers. And he'd tell you every single one. And he has he, they have huge following. So what they do is they, you know, they come up with these niche markets, and they're smart, and they, um, you know, all the power to them. And and they're putting out a good service, and they're reaching people. I mean, I was just at a conference where they're saying, you know, Instagram now is one of the biggest influencers in terms of where people are booking their travels. And it used to be, yes. it used to be the woman in the relationship um, that would, the, that would pick the vacation places. And now they're saying it's the children and they're <laughs> seeing it on Instagram and they go up to their parents and say, this is where I want to go for our vacation. Wow. And that's where they go. And it's, it's really changing. Do you think that's uh, a good would, way to pick where you're going is uh, somebody's phonied up Instagram picture? <laughs> if you're, a, you know, if you're really rich and <laughs> I guess really if spoiled, it doesn't matter, yeah, if you're really spoiled. It, I mean, almost every single person's Instagram is heavily edited, including mine. So, you know, the the images that that we're showing aren't really yeah. what it really looks like. It's more like a, a, a fantasy. So I, I I actually wanted to ask that question. I there wasn't enough time. Um, you know, what happens when you go on these trips and they come back and they're like, it didn't really look like that. Mm -mm. Well, pick that's you know? that's really the secret of photography is you're taking a little framed image where you cut out all the ugly stuff, and you only yeah. Do, if you follow Instagram now allows you to follow hashtags. So if you follow the hashtag like adventure travel for instance, it's a quick way to see all of the people in that uh, genre who are posting and what their pictures look like. And yeah, I mean, I want to go to every one of these places. They're gorgeous. Right. Do they look sure. like that for real? I don't know. I, but, Not uh, all of them, but yeah. you, you, get, you get a general sense. So yeah. uh, it just, just if you put a regular photo up and you don't edit it, it's, you know, it comes out darker. It's just not going to be that appealing. And I, I don't know. It, it, it it's, has its pros and cons. It's actually, I'm going to, Okay, the secret's out of the bag. I'm going to tell you. I used to always post all my travel pictures on Instagram. I've become so turned off by this edited vision of life. I've actually uh, deactivated my Instagram account. You won't see any pictures from me on this trip. Well, I've deactivated Facebook first, then Instagram, and now I also have uh, gone private on Twitter. I don't want to participate because I do feel like it's a phony kind of like show-off-y thing. It's very self-absorbed, and I don't want to do I, it. I anymore. don't think everyone is on that. No, no, but, no, you're not. No, in lot. fact, that's the you know the number one thing I'm going to miss is following your pictures on Instagram because that's I love that. The good news is you don't actually have to have an Instagram account or a Twitter account or a Facebook account to look at public postings there. You can just go to Instagram.com and look at all sure. the pictures. So if you go to Instagram.com/slash Johnny Jet, even if you don't have an account, you can see 
your pictures. Well, hopefully they'll go to my website because that drives traffic, johnnyjet.com. <laughs> go to Johnny's website. That's what I was telling you the other day. That's where so, you should send people. So I got a new website for you, by the way. Just it's it's a brand new service actually, and you might see it when you're booking trips, um, if you're on on travel agencies or even airline sites, and you might not notice it. But if you look to the far right, it will say, you know, for five dollars, we, we you can get this. Um, well, there, if you can go direct, it's called blueribbonbags.com. So basically, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you heard of these guys? Yeah. It's Is basically it an insurance. I haven't used it, but. I mean, these days, airlines have gotten so good at not losing bags because right. of the technology. They're scanning every bag before, you know, right when you check it in, before you get on the plane, before it gets on the plane, it checks. And actually, most airlines, you can go into your – hopefully, you download the airline app and you can look at your, your flight details and it will say, you know, you, your bags are, you know, are now on the plane. It will show you. And really? Then it, Really? Yeah, an American, oh, I, I know that. when to go, when to go to the bar baggage carousel. I don't always run because, first of all, American takes forever for their bags to come out. And secondly, <laughs> um, it, I can look at the app and it says your bags have just been unloaded off the plane. What? And then there's another one that says it's now um, arrived. Oh, so I got to get the four. app. So That's yeah, just really the, cool. whatever airline, Delta, Delta, I think, is the one that started it. I'm on uh, Air France slash Delta because they're, I don't know, like the code shares. They're, 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 they're partner. They're, yeah. They're, 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 Sky team, yeah. but um, I'm not sure. I haven't done Air France in a while, but well, I'll, I'll um, report back. Zara, they are. You can let me know. But this blue ribbon bag is only five bucks. It's not expensive. That might be a no. nice little bit of peace of mind. And the reason why it's so inexpensive is because the chances of them losing them are very slim. Right. But right. this is a great way to make some money because you actually want your bag to get lost for five dollars. <laughs> if your bag is gone for four days or more, yeah, they will send you a check for. A thousand dollars, and they don't have to see any receipts. If you, if the airline loses your bag, you have to show every kind of receipt. They're going to depreciate everything that's in there. Wow. They don't cover electronics, jewelry, things like that. So this is uh, I'm going to do this. We're only checking one bag each, two bags total, ten bucks. I hope they lose my bags. And actually, they actually <laughs> offer if you pay seven dollars and fifty cents per bag, you'll get fifteen hundred. If you pay ten dollars, you'll get two thousand dollars. It's kind of like gambling. <laughs> And actually, the one airline that lost my bag is for the longest was Air France. I was on we, a. Uh, we do. Is it more? It's more dangerous if you cha if you have to change planes, right? Like we're without a doubt. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, a nonstop. It's unlikely they're going to lose your bags. They'll have to be stolen for that to happen. But if well, you change flights, they may not make the next flight. And they say actually in their terms, they say you cannot order the service um, in you know in, in between flights. Um, we have to order it but, now before we leave, in other words. And a good tip for you and Lisa, if you're both checking a bag, yeah. so the tip is that you put half your clothes in her bag and she puts half in yours. Oh. That way, if they lose one of the bags, we the other one got one half of you guys a clothes. Of clothes. But here's a tip. Don't put the top half in one bag and the bottom half in the other. You'd want a full <laughs> set. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, and always <laughs> carry on if you're going to a wedding or something very important. I put all my shirts in Lisa's. <laughs> bag and now i have to walk around topless yeah listen i i've actually had to walk around for a few days with the same clothes no that's no fun or or or, or you know or running to find a um store which you know these days is easy unless you're going to france and there's a holiday going on like what happened when i was there for bastille day and, and that's could, not nothing easy. was you know the french are great don't even yeah. go in august everybody's left there's, no, there's nobody there it's empty. <laughs> Italy too. <laughs> Italy too. They're so. all gone. Uh, yes. Johnny, it's so much fun to talk to you, and you always make me want to hit the road. The good news is I am. But uh, <laughs> next week it'll be Rich Demuro taking care of you, and uh, Johnny, you'll join him and uh, have some more travel tips. Rich, you probably know, is the, the tech guy on KTLA TV in Los Angeles. You probably watch him every evening. I do. Rich is a great guy, he's and I really love watching nice guy. him. Yeah, he's, he's really, good. really informative. Although I think I'm going to be traveling on the, on uh -oh. the 19th. So I might have, I'm I'll gonna let have you to work that out check. with Mr. D. Okay. Thank you, Johnny. Safe travels. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're going to take some more calls right after this. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. On we go with the calls. Ron from Downey. Hi, Ron. Thanks for hanging on. Hey, it's good to talk to you again, Leo. My pleasure. What's up? Hey. So I've got an LG TV, an LG soundbar, and an older Yamaha 5.1 receiver. Okay. There's only one optical out 
on the back of the TV. Right. And in a perfect world, I would like to watch everyday TV through the sound bar. Right. And I'll watch a Blu-ray or stream a movie. I'd like to use my surround sound. Do I need an optical switcher or a, a, no. a splitter? So, or, or I think all you need to do is connect the optical to the uh, sound bar because it wants optical. Right. And then uh, you have um, you have an AV receiver, right? Yeah, but there's no HDMI connections. It's an older one. The only oh, I get it. It's an analog. All right. Yeah, because there is usually on a TV an ARC HDMI. That's audio return channel. And that's set up so that if you're connecting to a sound system, but the TV is the content's coming from the TV, whether it's from a smart TV and it's Netflix built in or, or whatever, it will send that out over the ARC via the HDMI cable to the AV receiver. But you don't you have an analog receiver. Right. And so, well, the optical's not going to help you anyway. Um, well, and I have an optical. I can connect the receiver to the TV through the optical. You can. So it has an I optical. Can. It has Toslink, but it just doesn't have HDMI. Right, okay. and so now I I can and I can hook the sound bar to the TV through the ARC, but I only have three HDMI's on my TV, and one would be for the receiver, and one would be for the sound uh, bar. And then now, and so where's the where's the con, where's the source of the content? No, one would be the HDMI. If I use the ARC, then I can hook the, the sound bar. Do I need to hook the Blu-ray player then to the sound bar? Oh, the Blu-ray is the problem. I get it. Um, Blu-ray is going to go in via HDMI. Yeah, nor I mean, the normal way that they expect you to wire this is then use the optical out of the TV, which will take the uh, video, the audio from the HDMI uh, connector on the Blu-ray into the TV. Will then split the audio out to the uh, sound bar. But you want to somehow get the audio out to your AV receiver. I want to be able to switch between the two. I want the option to, to listen to either. So I don't know if I need an optical switcher or an optical splitter. Uh, yeah, I guess that would work. I'm trying to think if there's a way to do it with what you've got. You want to play a Blu-ray okay. player, a, yes. a Blu-ray disc into the TV. You're not going through the receiver in that case, right? You're just going right into the TV. Going the TV, but I'd like to listen to it through my surround sound, right. not the sound bar. Ah, oh, and the surround sound is on the AV, uh, the analog AV receiver. You really should just buy a new receiver. You know that, right? Right. <laughs> you really want an AV receiver that supports HDMI. That's the long-term solution to this. Correct. Um, short term. Short term. You can so you want to get the you want to watch a Blu-ray player Blu-ray disc the audio and video are coming out over the HDMI into the TV. You need you could use optical connecting to the AV receiver, but sometimes you want to use a sound bar. Yeah, I guess an optical splitter would work. So I need a splitter, not a switch. I, ha I have no experience doing this, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to say I don't know. If you need a switch or a splitter, how much are? The, is there a big difference in price? No. Just the splitter, the the, the switch has one in, one out and three ins, and the and the splitter is the other way around. Oh, that's has interesting. One in and three out. So, it out. so it goes out. Does it go out from the TV to the in and the splitter, and then from the splitter to the receiver and to the sound bar? Boy, I have no idea. I wish Scott Wilkinson were here, but I, to be honest, I don't even know if Scott would have any idea uh, on this one. Um, let me let me think about this here. You 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 have a Blu-ray disc. It's connected via HDMI to your TV, and what would certainly work is an optical out to one of those two devices. Your TV right. also has other audio out. I presume it has some sort of analog out, which you could also hook up to the AV receiver. The problem with that is you're going to have a lip sync issue because there's going to be a difference in the timing of the audio when you get the analog out versus what's on the screen. Most TVs will have a way to accommodate that, uh, the setting where you can sl slow down the video or speed up the audio to get them to match. 
Um, so that would be one solution, is to use an analog channel to the AV receiver out of the TV. Uh, if you have an ARC, uh, but you don't have HDMI, you can use the ARC to the sound bar, right? You said that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then the optical. What do I plug? What do I plug into the? What do I plug into the input on the sound bar? I have a I have a Chromecast and a Blu-ray player. Oh man, this is crazy complicated. It would be so easy to get an AV receiver and solve all this. Um, so uh, let's see. So. <laughs> The topology is hard. I'm having a hard time imagining the topology. I'm trying to visualize the uh, topology in my head here. I mean, of course, let's see. Okay, the way it is right now. No, I understand. I, I do understand it. I'm just trying to think of uh, how to best do this. You know, it's not expensive to get a, a, an optical splitter. I would say the switch is going to be more active. Now, you said the switch is one in, three out, and the splitter... No, the other way. The other way around. The, the, the switch is one The switch is one out, three, three in. Three in. And that's, so that's the reason that's a switch is you can say it's all going to one place, but you could say I want the audio to come from one of three devices. The splitter is the other way around. I think that's what you want, which is you can... You're taking one input and you're splitting it out to two different receivers. The sound bar and the AV receiver. Okay. That sounds like optical. that sounds like the right way to do it. So I need an optical splitter. I think that's the yeah. I mean, uh, don't get something too cheap because one of the problems you're going to have. Well, I guess they could use mirrors, right? Isn't it going to get a lot dimmer if you're splitting this? I don't know. <laughs> I've never tried this. A splitter sounds like the right solution. Okay. It's only five bucks. Give it a shot. Yep. All right. <laughs> Thanks for the call. I'm I'm confusing myself. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. All right, here. <laughs> uh, the this is part of the problem is uh, our fourth. I'm just thinking, my still thinking about our, our last caller. I'm trying. I'm draw, literally drawing on the back of an envelope, lines and arrows, and <laughs> to get all this working. The real problem is. Uh, it's such a jerry-rigged uh, situation. And that's why when you're thinking about your home theater, you really want to think about the inputs, uh, the quality you want. And ultimately, in my opinion, a home theater means g get a get an AV receiver that's designed to become the control center for the whole thing. The, of course, the trick is if you're getting a 4K HDR TV, everything along the chain has to be 4K HDR, including their sources, your Blu-ray player, UHD Blu-ray player, okay, that is. Your Roku or your Apple TV, you got to get the ultra, the high-end versions that do 4K HDR. And, uh, and your receiver has to support it as well. And the receiver is such a great solution for this because basically it has inputs for any conceivable device and then outputs to your TV, and if you need to, can output to a sound bar as well. So we're going to put a link in the show notes because this is just, my brain is exploding. But we uh, have the chat room at, at, at hand, thank goodness. And Rocket88 has given us a link to a um, switcher, selector, extractor, splitter <laughs> from, from Amazon that will, uh, that will do all of that. There's also now the decoding issue, and that gets crazy too. This is... Um, Four uh, by one HDMI switch with audio optical toss link, ultra 4K. Man, this is crazy. The good news is these things are fairly cheap. Leo Laporte, let's take a break. I need a cup of coffee. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The tech guy podcast and my photos from my trip and <laughs> everything I do brought to you by WordPress, my blog at wordpress.com. I was talking, actually talking to my kids today. We had lunch uh, and... Uh, Abby has a WordPress site. Henry has a word, both on WordPress.com. I, when they were young, I don't, I think the, they were born in the early 90s. I don't think I got the websites, their websites then, but I, shortly thereafter, I registered their names as uh, .coms because I knew as they got to be adults, they'd want to have their own website. Every, I honestly believe everybody needs to have a website with where they are, where they live, that they own, they control, that that's the what you want is the thing that shows up first when somebody searches for your name. That should be in your control. It shouldn't be a Facebook page, a Twitter page. It shouldn't be the video your buddy posted of you at the bar last night. It should be should be your best stuff, your best foot forward. And if you're in a business, 
It's 10 times more important. The reason I, I have both kids on WordPress.com is because it's easy, it's fast. They don't have to spend a lot of time learning the ins and outs of HTML or CSS. They just need to post content. They've got hundreds of designs at WordPress.com to match your vision, establish your brand, no matter how much design experience you have, although it's kind of funny. Completely independently, Abby and I both chose the same theme. We used 2017. It's just, it just by chance. She said, I found a great theme. I said, oh, well, what is it? 2017. Oh, yeah, it is a great theme, isn't it? <laughs> but there's many more. And the nice thing is you keep doing your site. If someday you say, I don't want to look like Dad, and you want to change it, there's plenty of others to choose from. You press one button, boom, it's done. WordPress does all the hard stuff. They take care of the hosting. WordPress.com hosts your site. They keep it secure. Yes, HTTPS with every WordPress site. You get software updates automatically. You don't have to think about that. You just... Think about your content, what you're putting out there, about yourself, about your business. It's a great way to stay in touch with clients. Uh, you can upload images, video, audio, and more. You can import and export content to and from, so you're never stuck. It's your site. It's your home. It's your content. You own it, and that's the important thing about WordPress.com. Grow your audience. Reach new customers. It's got built-in search engine optimization. It handles it automatically. I just uh, I use the Jetpack a plug-in, and I get a site map and all that stuff just kind of automatically. I don't have to think about it. Social media sharing is great. Your customers can tell the world about you on their Facebook and their Twitter, which is nice because uh, then when people search for your business, not only do you is your site number one, number two is some client saying, I love this guy. This is the best place. You get all kinds of marketing tools. You also... Get a great WordPress app, iOS and Android. I'm using that on vacation to post images during the, you know, during my trip on the blog. Makes it really easy to do. In fact, I have an automated uh, script that does it all, so it makes it very simple. And by the way, if you ever have any questions, the WordPress support team is the best. I've never met nicer people who are better at what they do. They are so smart. 24-7, they're there when you need it. And it's so affordable. WordPress plans start at $4 a month. We're going to save you even more. If you go to WordPress.com slash tech guy, 15% off. The stat that really gets me, 31% of all the websites, 31% of the internet runs on WordPress. That should tell you something. 15% off when you go to WordPress.com slash tech guy to create your new website. WordPress.com slash tech guy. I thank WordPress. For my site, leolaporte.com, for my kids' sites, for your site, and for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Thank you, WordPress. Now on with the show. I am Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Hey, 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 time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. We're going to do something a little different in this segment. Normally, uh, we'd take some more calls, and I do have more calls coming, but... I wanted to talk with my friend Adam Fisher. He has a new book. I want to give him a big plug because it's a great book. It's kind of a history of Silicon Valley as told by the people who were there. It's called Valley of Genius. The uncensored history of Silicon Valley is told by the hackers, founders, and freaks who made it boom. Valleyofgenius.com slash twit if you want to pick up a copy. He has 200 plus interviews with some of the most interesting people in Silicon Valley. And he's consented to let us run some of them on the show. Today, a name you're not going to know, Scott Hassan. But you ought to, because without Scott Hassan, there'd be no Google. Who, who is Scott Hassan? Set so this up for Scott us. Hassan is really the unacknowledged co-founder of Google. Okay. What do you mean unacknowledged? Does Google admit that he exists? No, Google admits that he exists. But you know, you read the standard biographies, and he 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 shows up as a as a supernumerary. It's Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Brin, Page, Page, Brin. Right, but but Hassan was there working on what would become Google before Sergey, which is astonishing. So it was Larry Page and Scott Hassan. Basically, wow. so here we go. Let's set the stage. We're at Stanford in the computer science PhD program, and Scott Hassan is very clever, um, but wasn't able to get into the PhD program as a student. He got himself in by getting hired by the CS department at Stanford as a programmer to help the PhD students. This is the funny thing. At Stanford, a lot of the people in computer science don't actually like to program. 
which is really funny, mm. you know? Or, or they're not very good at it, or all these weird problems, right? Yeah. They'd rather think about the concepts, which is, which is fine. It's just that at some point you need to get the computers to do something, right? <laughs> and I really enjoy communicating. I, I feel, that, you know, my superpower, like Superman's superpower is he can fly around. So uh, Spider-Man can, like, make webs and stuff like that. My superpower is I can talk to computers. He's writing code for PhD students at Stanford. He's sitting in the computer lab, kind of a, you know, a grunt. Yeah, he's making $41,000 a year, which is, even for that time, kind of nothing for a programmer. Larry Page is a PhD student. He has an idea for a search engine. And who's he going to go to? Scott Hassan? No? Not quite. So Larry's idea is, I want to get a PhD <laughs> by studying the web. Yeah, he's but at Stanford. He's paying some good money for this. Yeah, let's get, right. a, let's get a doctorate. So what you have to do if you want to study the web, you have to download the web. And at that time, it was just barely possible to download the web. And so Larry hacks up some code to download the web. Oh, so he's not writing a search engine yet. He just wants to get the copy, a copy of the internet. Exactly. He's, he wants to put it under a microscope. But to do that, he needs to look at it right. as one thing. Right. And so he's downloading it. Um, and he's wrote some code to download it. And it's garbage code i remember one weekend i just took his all his code i took his whole entire thing and threw it all out and rewrote the whole thing in the weekend the thing that he's been working on for months right i just rewrote the whole thing in python um without telling him and i wrote it in such a way so then very quickly over a weekend i could download thirty-two thousand pages simultaneously um so larry went from you know, his, his system went from barely doing, you know, b very buggily doing 100 to 32,000 simultaneously on a single machine. We started completely destroying the DNS capacity of all of Stanford. It wasn't, it wasn't designed for this performance. And we were looking up, you know, tens of thousands of DNS lookups mm -hmm. per second. Mm -hmm. Because I, th I, th I threaded it all. I was like, okay, I need to make this go as fast as... Or, sorry, I didn't thread it. I did it all asynchronously. Mm -hmm. So once I did it asynchronously, it could... You know, it would just destroy things. It would just like, bam! You know, because it just could... It, it wasn't limited by anything. It was just limited by the network speed. And it turns out Stanford... Entire Stanford, the whole entire place had a 45 megabit connection to the internet at the time. And so we're using all of it. Sergey hasn't gotten involved in this yet. It was just me and Larry doing this, right? Oh, I didn't realize. Um, Sergey had nothing, uh, really nothing to do with it. Um, um, now, he was a friend, and Larry is my friend. And so generally friends hang out together. And so we started hang, all hanging out together, right? Um, and... Uh, and so in this system, since I was running this program, writing this program that runs, that grabs all the web pages, but that throws them out, I then started, I put a little thing in there to find all questions. I wanted to find the questions. Um, so when I, I, I would go through a web page to finding all the links, I would also find all the questions, and then I would store the question and the next sentence of all the web pages. Because I wanted this other Alaska system to go whipping fast. And so I knew if I created my own little thing of it, I could answer the questions really fast. And so I started doing that. Then I was like thinking to myself, huh, why don't we just build a full search engine? Like we almost have everything. We're throwing all this stuff out and we're like, why don't we just build our own search engine and it'd be super fast. Mm -hmm. And so then, but then, you know, I talked to people you know, I talked to Larry, you know, and he was like, oh, that's too much work. And and it's not research. There's no research there, right? Both Larry and Sergey thought it was going to be a lot of work. I was like, no, no, no. Actually, it's not that much work. I know exactly how to do it. I did it like, like many years beforehand, like five years beforehand. I did it like in a couple, you know, like a couple weeks. So, you know, very quickly and under, I think, six weeks, we built the, the, the first structure of the, uh, the, the search engine. 
since we already had the the crawler that we'd been writing like six week six months prior mm -hmm. in less than I think six eight weeks we were able to build the whole structure of, of Google mm -hmm. um, and that was mostly just Larry or no, Sergey and I mm -hmm. at like two o'clock in the morning from two to like six in the morning we would build build it um, work on that um, mainly because we weren't on really like if I worked on it during the day I would get yelled at by my advisors and my boss, right? Because you're mm -hmm. supposed to work on the digital outreach project. Mm -hmm. And building a search engine was not considered research. Mm. And so it wasn't supposed to work on that. So, mm. so I said, okay, fine. I'm just going to work at night. The way I see Silicon Valley, it's like a huge, huge, huge company mm. where there's no one running it. And you can do whatever the f you want. And, and the only thing that matters is whether the market cares about what you produce or not. That's the only thing that matters. Scott Hassan, the third founder of Google. Thank you, Adam Fisher. Valley of Genius available in bookstores, or you can go to valleyofgenius.com to get a copy of your own. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Back to the phones. Line four, Bob in... Uh Oh, Leonia, New Jersey. It's good to talk to you again, Bob. I think I've talked to you before, haven't I? Oh, yes, numerous yeah. times. And you're always our, uh, not only our mentor, but our savior. And Thank you, Bob. Well, you know how I remember uh, Bob is such a unique name. No, that's not how I remember. I remember okay. because that's where my mom and dad were next door neighbors when they met, married, and had me. So uh, Leonia has a soft spot in my heart. That's right. That's how that's how I was able to convince Kim to sneak me on. <laughs> oh, you don't need to sneak on. You're always welcome, Bob. What can I do for you? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have a couple of quick questions that I'd like to ask you. Sure. The first one is um, my wife has an iPhone 7, and uh, we recently actually were not too far from you out in California and um, went to a big party for my grandson, <clears throat> took a whole bunch of uh, videos. Lovely. And then when she wanted to send the videos to people, she kept getting messages saying they're too large. They're too large. Yes. They won't go. They yes. won't go. Yes. Okay. So um, I, called, uh, I called Apple and I went... Uh, you know, went through it with them, and uh, they told me, uh, well, I could use um, the uh, iCloud or something, which uh, we, we take a lot of pictures, so we're, we've exhausted this. Uh, space <laughs> you almost, you almost, so attaching even a photograph, often they're too big to email. Plus, you've heard me say, because you listen, don't send and use an open email attachments. That's dangerous. Plus, it, you know, some people have some severe limits on the size of the uh, mail they can store in their inbox. It comes, in some cases, as low as 10 megabytes. Your video is definitely bigger than 10 megabytes. You probably even have pictures bigger than that. Maybe three pictures, you'd fill up their entire mailbox. So in general, we always say don't attach videos and pictures. Just as Apple said, it's much better to put them somewhere on the net and then share them. And my favorite way to do this doesn't cost you money. iCloud is great if you have enough iCloud storage and you don't mind paying for it. They only give you five gigabytes free to start and then you have to pay for more. Look at Google Photos. So if she puts Google Photos on her phone. Right, which she has. Good. All right. The only drawback on Google Photos on iPhone is, and this is an Apple limitation, you have to have it open once in a while for it to copy those files up to the Google Cloud. It is free, though. It will copy vo videos and photos. So periodically, maybe at the end of the day, just open Google Photos, especially when you're on Wi-Fi, you have a high-speed connection. Open Google Photos and let it back up. And it'll show you a little, it has a little indicator on the picture that it's backing it up. And then once they're all backed up, Actually, it's kind of nice. You can then open the settings in Google Photos and say, delete backed up photos. That'll save you space on your phone. Videos especially can really mm -hmm. fill up a phone. You'll still have access to them because you open the Google Photos app and you'll see them there just as you would with uh, Apple's photos. But there's a nice feature in Google Photos. Besides the fact that the storage is free, sharing is really good. And you can set up a album that uh, you can sh just has all the stuff in it that you send a link uh, you can uh, say, but the people, I think the people who want to look at it 
Now, this is a good question. Maybe they'll have to have a Google photo or Google login. And if most people have Gmail, so yes. maybe they will. That would be a drawback. Uh, but I may be wrong. I don't know. I'll have to try it without a log, you know, logged out. It might be you can still see them. They have some really nice features. For instance, you can say anything. I, t I do this with my wife. Anything I take a Lisa automatically just share that to her or create an album. It'll also create albums based on uh, time of day, locations. So you can say Friday in uh, San Francisco, and it'll actually make a little album, a little uh, make little videos. It does a lot of nice things automatically uh, that you might find useful. But, it, but it's fundamentally, the storage is free and the sharing is free. And I think that's the best way to do it myself. That, that sounds great. Now, so you could set it up so you're saying share all photos on, <clears throat> excuse me, July 17th exactly. with, uh, with my daughter Heidi. Yeah, right. you could do it with 10 different people. You have as many people as you want. They'll all get a link that if you update that album, the link will include anything you've updated. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a magical link that will always give them everything that you've put in that album. Uh, there are other companies that do this, uh, you know, for free. Shutterstock, for instance, uh, not Shutterstock. Shutterfly is a free uh, photo uh, printing company, uh, not a free company to print, but free to store, and they will uh, let you upload albums and share albums. And the idea there is they'll make their money because your, you know, your family and friends will print some of those photos. So yeah. Shutterfly is another one to look at. Um, Amazon Prime, if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, they have an app. But I like Google Photos. I think it works really well. They use a lot of AI. They do face recognition. So it makes it uh, very easy to find and uh, categorize and then share photos. Okay. So <clears throat> when you say that it's easy to find, you can say find, again, um, my grandson Ryan? Yes. Um, how would it know his name? Well, it doesn't until you tell it. So you can turn on uh, face recognition and add Ryan. And is Ryan grow the amazing thing to me? As Ryan grows up, it will continue to recognize him. And uh -huh. I have, you know, my son. I could say show all the pictures of Henry that I've ever taken. I've got forty thousand photos there, and it does a remarkable job. You can also say search for all the pictures I took in San Francisco. It'll find those because your camera, your phone automatically is putting location information in. You can say search for every picture I took of dogs. And it's smart enough to know what a dog looks like. They'll get a few cats in there, but it's pretty good. Fabulous. Yeah, the, uh, Google, they call it the Google Assistant. It will also periodically uh, modif you know, make black and white versions. Just kind of randomly, they use their artificial intelligence to, the, you know, they say, improve the pictures. I, I reject many of those. But the fact that it does it and then they're there and there's no cost to it, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. cool. And then, of course, remember that, that they can be viewed anywhere. So they can be viewed on a phone, on a tablet. And on your desktop computer at photos.google.com. The fact that they do this for free is amazing. And I, the, the only explanation I've ever heard is that, well, Google's trying to build their artificial intelligence capabilities. And as we know, in order to get machine learning to work, you have to have massive data sets. So things like recognizing dog pictures, well, they get better and better at it thanks to all the people who are uploading pictures of their dogs. So they get something out of it. But those pictures are private. You know, you're, you're not sharing them with the world unless you explicitly say, yeah, share this with my niece. <laughs> okay. So I, I really like, I, I have no trouble with it. I don't feel like there's any uh, privacy issue. And, I, you know, I have a timeline slider. I'm looking, I go back all the way to uh, 2005. That's a lot of photos. Wow. Yeah. And it's wonderful to have them and have them categorized. You know, if I want to see pictures uh, of the show I did in Canada in 2005, I could just say type in, you know, Toronto or type in Amber MacArthur, and there they all are. That is amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah, Unbelievable. it really is. I think is it set up also uh, what's equivalent to like the moments on, yep. the, on the iPhone? A lot of what Apple's done with photos, to be honest, are copies of what Google's done on its photos. And there's some, right. there's some cross pollinization in the other direction as well. But uh, Google's yeah. really got it down. And take a look at the sharing tab. You can also do that. And I find this really convenient on the desktop. So once those photos are uploaded, you can then sit down at your laptop or computer and, and do all the sharing, which makes it easier. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I am Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are going back to the phones. And Nick in San Diego's next. Hello, Nick. Thanks for hanging on. Hey, Leo. Thanks for uh, taking my call. My pleasure. And I just want to thank 
thank you for all the work you do. This is a, a lot of folks out there are challenged technically and uh, somebody like you on the, uh, on the internet and on the uh, radio helps out a lot of us. So we all appreciate your help. Oh, aren't you sweet? Thank you. Hey, I was calling. I don't know if this is your area of expertise, but I was trying to find uh, some historical images of a property I'm looking at. And I, thought that Google had it, but it doesn't seem like Google Earth does that anymore unless I'm missing something. Do you know anything? Oh about yeah, it? it used to be it could go back in time. Right. Um that's a good question. Um well, I forgot even how you did that. There was a, a go like a button or something to go back in time. How far back do you want to go? Oh I'd say about ten years. Yeah, that would be cool, wouldn't it? And you, of course, it'd be satellite photos, but you can see what modifications would be done and and all that. Oh, um, exactly. Right. I don't know if Google Maps does it. Google Earth, I think, still does. Have you tried Google Earth? Yeah, and that's what I was working on. Yeah, I found out there's a web version and there's a desktop version. Apparently, the web version does not have it at all. Ah, so you got to use the desktop. Oh, okay. Even that, okay. Even at that. Maybe it's not for every property. I don't know. Um, well, it, it would, you know, so what happens, what, what Google Earth and Google Maps use is, of course, satellite imagery from a variety of sources, uh, including, of course, American sources, but others as well. There's a lot of satellites up there. And it would just depend on, you know, whether they had purchased those images. But since Google Earth and Maps have been around for a decade, I think going back 10 years should be uh, pretty straightforward. So... You are on the area where you want to see past years. In the bot, it says in the bottom left corner. I don't have Google Earth on my machine right now. There's a date, and you can click the year next to the clock icon to open the time slider and slide back in time. Now I I should download Google Earth and and see. But you say it's it's not at Earth.Google.com. You need to use the uh, standalone app. That's interesting. I don't know why they would they would do that. Yeah, I think it might be resources. Uh, I, bet, I don't know. I'll well, and license, you know, there's probably a license fee for the, for those images. Okay. When you launch Google Earth, it says loading in progress, 4.23 billion of 4.54 billion years processed. So <laughs> that's a very googly thing to do. It's obviously a joke. I don't think they have 4.54 billion years of uh, imagery. But let me uh, let me zoom in on, uh, on our little... Um, our little planet, and see if I can uh, go back in time. I'm on the on the web version of this. Okay, so you're on the web. What yeah, I, I it's it, on on YouTube is the web version doesn't have it, but the desktop version. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything in the in the uh, clock. So yeah, I don't know why they would uh, do it on one but not the other. But maybe there's limitations in uh, what they can do. I see people. Uh, drag and drop to enter street view. I see a fix your current location. I see 3D, but you're right. I don't see uh, I don't see anything about uh, historic data. So there. So uh, maybe it's the Pro app that we need. Uh, G okay. Scott, who's in the chat room, says there's a button on the Pro app that will let you do that. That's that would you know what this makes sense because of course they have to license this uh, data it's not free to google in most cases and i would imagine that older historic data you know if you want to continue to display it you've got to pay for a license so it sounds like you need uh, google earth pro to go back in time uh, okay yeah uh i don't i don't like a subscription service uh let me see what they charge for this i um I, I don't know. Yeah, I, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But uh, you, no, pro's free. All right. So uh, now somebody in the chat says, "No, you don't need the pro app. You need the app." Clearly, I, I'm trying to do it on the web. Same thing. Yeah. What a good idea, though. Uh, are you a realtor? Or, you said, or no? I'm looking at a piece of property, and there's there's been a lot of changes, and I'm being told they were just done recently, but. Yeah, I'd like to check that out myself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, figure it out. No, yeah. no, nothing escapes the eye. In the sky. Exactly. <laughs> I'm all for reigning in Google, to be perfectly honest with you, but at this point, I need their, well, their hacking. Hey, it's a, it's a useful tool, isn't it? It is. It <laughs> that's is. funny. Yeah, I'm going to download it now because that's a, I forgot about that feature. That's a that's a, a great idea. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. 
Thanks, Leo. You take care. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words, too. Dan in Fresno, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Dan. Hey, Leo. Um, I got a question for you. We are, our church is thinking about starting to um, live stream our services. Excellent. And so they're, they're looking for recommendations on, on cameras. Um, I would say cheap. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, <laughs> cheap, go cheap. We, uh, as you know, you probably do anyway. I imagine that's why you called live stream everything we do. We're live streaming right now. And uh, you could, sure, go out and buy fancy broadcast quality high def cameras for tens of thousands of dollars. But the cameras we use, the Canon Vixias, are consumer grade camcorders uh, that are under $1,000. I think these now are about four or $500. Uh, they sit on all the time. Uh, they're always streaming. Uh, we bought 40 of them back, you know, five years ago when we first set up the studio because I didn't want to pay for camera operators. And it's the same for church services. There are only a few different things to look at. The choir, mm -hmm. the choir master, the pastor, maybe have an audience camera. Four or five cameras would be more than sufficient. Uh, and then uh, you you have a choice. If you want to live stream it, you need some way to switch cameras. So if you want more than one camera, don't forget to include a switcher in your budget. You can go to Blackmagic uh, and look at what they've got. They've got a lot of kind of specialized cameras that are fairly affordable. But honestly, consumer-grade camcorders seem to work fine for us. The only issue uh, from time to time, uh, you know, batteries and power supplies die. But you can buy, mm -hmm. uh, you know... Uh, actually, not batteries, because we take the batteries out for them to continue continuously stream. Uh, but the power supplies do seem to die. The cameras themselves are fairly reliable. The good news is they're so cheap, uh, you know. But my, my, my advice is really don't think about 4K. Don't even think about 1080p, because when you're streaming it, you've got to think about the bandwidth. Not only the bandwidth you're using, but the bandwidth your, your, pa your parishioners are using to watch. And if you make it too high quality... They're not going to get a good experience. 720p is plenty. It's still high def. So any camera that can do 720p reliably is all you need. You don't need a 4K studio and all of that. One of the things that we were kind of worried about is where they want to place the, the primary camera is about 70, 75 feet away from the stage. Yeah, so you need a lot of zoom. One of the ones we were looking at was or the, I think it's the Mixia... G20. That's what we use. And, the, G, and yeah. the G40. Yep. Somebody said not to use the G20 because it was too far away. Yeah, you'll have to look at the what they call the zoom ratio and see how much they can zoom in. We Our cameras are not too far away from me. They're about eight feet away from me. Uh, but, the, yeah, we use. I'm pretty sure we use the G20, which is now $800 list. It means you can get it for even mm -hmm. less. Um, let me what see what the, the, the... Go ahead. The, the Zoom Q8. Have you... Ever, you know, looked at that? I, you know, Zoom is an interesting uh, story because they basically uh, started as an audio recording, you know, handy audio recorders for podcasters and radio and so forth. And they're they're not considered traditionally a camera company, but they do make these. Um, right. I just I don't have any experience with them. Uh, Zoom, I think, is good stuff if the price is right. And yeah, you've got to consider how much Zoom. How much Zoom do I need on my Zoom? Uh, the Zoom Q8, that's, uh, yeah, 4-track HD video, 4-track audio. Yeah, these look pretty good. You don't need a lot. It's not a demanding uh, situation. The camera's not going to move and so forth. Those Vixias work great for us, but these Zooms look good, too. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Our podcast is brought to you by, and there are expenses, by the way. Somebody's got to keep the lights on. Keep my, my, my bouncy ball inflated. Pay for the microphones. Our sponsors are fine sponsors. And there's one sponsor that literally brings you our podcast if you have an Android phone. Qualcomm. The Qualcomm Snapdragon is the premier processor in smartphones today. Especially when it comes to data speed. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you have a Qualcomm or some other data modem in your phone. But you might. If you check out the stats at Ookla, Ookla, which is, you know, they do speedtest.net and they have the speed test app. They analyzed a million real world results from the last quarter, from Q2 2018. Real people 
on AT&T and T-Mobile, they found that Android phones with Snapdragon 845 from Qualcomm Technologies was up to 192% faster than <laughs> non-Android phones with Intel modems. Hmm, wonder what those could be. <laughs> Seriously, I have both. And when I want speed, you know what I use. 192% faster? I'm on Snapdragon, baby. Snapdragon 845. It's engineered with powerful features that allow you to do even more with your phone. All the new flagship phones coming out with Snapdragon 845, and you get so much. Immersive AR and VR. They're, they have a, a DSP in there, the Qualcomm Hexagon 685. It's third generation. That It's used for AI, for voice recognition, for speech, for your, for your camera. You know why that camera is so good on that new phone? Qualcomm, baby. Virtual reality, augmented reality, gaming. They also built in a new secure processing unit. This is important. This is actually really important. It's engineered to help protect your personal data. So, for instance, fingerprints or iris scans, they're stored in the secure location so that no prying eyes can get to them. They're, they're, they're protected. That's good. Energy efficient. You probably noticed that if you have one. And all-day battery life. And... I love Qualcomm's Quick Charge 3.0. 50% charge in 15 minutes. So you never add a juice. Check out all the data for yourself at qualcomm.com slash twit. Then upgrade your data speeds with a phone powered by Snapdragon 845. Qual Did you even know that it mattered? It does. Qualcomm.com slash twit. And we thank Snapdragon uh, and the 845 for bringing the Tech Guy podcast to you at lightning speeds. Now, on with the show. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Da, 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 da. We've gone, you've taken you now to the beautiful Studio 64 in Manhattan, <laughs> New York, where we are about to watch Dick D perform an extremely difficult... What do they call those disco dances? Is there names? There's the rope, right? Was that what they called it? In the... Yeah. The, there's the swim. The swim? No, that's not disco, the... is it? Do they do that? I don't know. Well, you hold your nose and you do the... Uh, anyway. Well, uh, well, I, actually, when I dance, a lot of people do hold their nose, but I'm not <laughs> sure it's... I'm not sure it's a, a dance step. <laughs> Dick uh, DiVartolo, Mads Maddest writer, disco fan. That's why we play the disco music and the host of the Gizwiz podcast. He joins us each week at about this time to talk about a gizmo or a gadget that he's fond of. Yeah, well, this gadget is... is I like it for the way it looks, okay? It's marginally better than what I replaced it with, but looks-wise, it's 100% better. So, uh, I have Wait a little a minute, Mr. No. Coffee. I'm just trying to imagine. Is it a mirror? No. Okay. No. No, no it's a little... Get, you know what? I have one of those Mr. Coffee coffee warmers. Oh, all right? and okay. I had it for years, yeah. and it, it has a crack in it, and I'm thinking, you know... I put the coffee cup down and some coffee spills over and this is AC. Am I going to short this out? So I figured it's time to buy a new one. And I go, maybe there's some sort of high tech coffee warmer. Maybe they've improved the technology in the 23 years since you bought the old one. Exactly. And they have. Yay. So I bought the Kasari Premium. 24 watt stainless steel digital <laughs> Ooh. digital coffee warmer with adjustable thermostat. However, what I didn't realize is that even though it says the temperature range is 77 to 230 degrees, it says that is the temperature of the hot plate. The warmest it can make your coffee is 131 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's good because 230 is degrees is pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> I think 100 is plenty. I know. But the problem is about 131 degrees is pretty much what everybody or or if you look up what is the perfect temperature for coffee, it's about 131 degrees. So what depressed me is... I never get to play with the up and down arrows for temperature because you just turn it on and hit full and oh. it sets itself for 230 degrees and 
warms up. So it does make it about five degrees warmer than my old <laughs> so Mr. Confusing. Coffee could make it. <laughs> so the, 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 the thing itself gets to a hundred... Uh, no, the thing itself will register 230 degrees. 200, but it's, wait a minute, if, if it were 230 degrees, it would make your coffee hotter than 130 degrees. You know what? Why, do, why does it not? Exactly. You know, I, <laughs> See, uh, these no, are the I, questions I, you have to ask, Dick. Wait a minute. I, <laughs> I have my, uh, you know, the little uh, wireless thermometer. You should test so, it. I did. And? It, it needs... Anywhere from 229 to 233 degrees. It should be boiling the coffee if it's that hot. It doesn't. Because if the coffee cup is open, isn't... It's not letting escaped? that much heat out. You can boil well, water in an open pot, can't you? I'm yeah, confused. But, well, wait a minute. Uh, Hold on, wait a minute. I got to take a break. We're going to take a break. We're going to do a commercial. Okay, okay. Dick, Get you, think, you think about this. <laughs> Get a scientist on the horn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're talking to Dick T. Bartolo, our gizmo wizard, and we're now baffled. Because no, we're not baffled. So I'm looking at the chat room, the chat room who knows everything, and they are saying, you have thermal heat loss. Oh, it's thermal heat loss. That explains it. There you go. So this is a 24-watt coffee mug warmer. Does it plug in or is it battery? It plugs in. Now, it plugs in, however, it has a big transformer plug, and it changes the 110 to 12 volts. Okay. Okay, so this eliminates through just filling the coffee on it and getting electrocuted. And the reason we're confused is because on the screen, it will say 230 degrees Fahrenheit, which, as you know, is more than boiling. Yes, and if you hold a surface temperature uh, thermometer to it, a wireless thermometer, it registers 129 to 132 degrees. But my coffee sitting on that only registered 131 degrees. Which is not as hot as you might want it, but it's hot well, enough. It's hot, it's hot oh, right? No, it's hot. Yeah, okay. no, it's absolutely hot. You don't want any hotter because it would burn your tongue. No. Okay. No. But How much is this? This Conf thing actually this miracle of modern science. <laughs> Unfortunately, it went up uh, about five dollars in the past two weeks. I paid one twenty four fifty. One hundred twenty four bucks. <laughs> Did I say one hundred twenty four? I twenty four fifty. Oh, I'm, oh, you said one twenty four fifty. I thought, oh, I, man, I, this I, guy I was, likes his coffee hot. Holy no, cow! I was, I was talking Fahrenheit dollars. Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. They'll take $124 from your wallet, but it really is only $24. Well, exactly, exactly. But now, today, <laughs> before we recorded this, I looked and it's now $29.99. And for some reason, it's one of those, would you like 5% off? Is it Amazon? It's Amazon. That's the problem with Amazon. They use this uh, these pricing algorithms, these computerized pricing models that go up and down depending on demand. All over the place. It's crazy. And, and it is crazy because uh, Chad and I have talked about something on the Gizwiz, and we're saying, this is like a most amazing buy ever, and by the next day, it's twice what we told people. Because of you. Because they bought it. I blame it. Yeah. you. So <laughs> I see it for $30. It could be less. It could be more. more. It just but the coupon is still there. Why? Uh, I, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I I just right. like I right. I think it looks very techy. And when people why do they in, show they go, blueberries? What's the what's the know, that, what is that? <laughs> There's a picture. If you go uh, to the Amazon oh, listing, you know, maybe you could do it as a little uh, a blueberry oven. warmer, <laughs> a tomato warmer. It says life tastefully. Kasari. Oh, maybe it's just part of their image. It is an attractive. It's brushed aluminum. It's very attractive. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, you know, cold coffee's bad. But on the other hand, I don't like co old coffee. So, but I, but I, but that's the problem. See, I figure, I don't know. This, this doesn't have that burnt flavor as you, after you leave it there for a while, does it? No, it doesn't. Okay. No, it does. Just keeps it warm. It keeps it warm. It uh, keeps it really nice. A really nice drinking temperature. Have you? I have the Ember mug. Have you ever seen that? Oh, uh, oh, that's the one that heats, right? Yeah, it's a coffee. So it's a coffee warmer. It you plug this in, and uh, and then 
the cup sits on it, but the cup is charging. The cup has a battery. So when you put the coffee in, it's like a ceramic oh. mug. And when you put the coffee in it, uh, then it keeps it warm, and you can set the temperature from your smartphone. But this does cost like 124 bucks. So, oh um, well, last is... last uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, we had the uh, the cauldron that you can actually cook in. Oh, the one the one that boils water, and and uh, they sent me one. Yeah, and it's unbelievable. There's a blender attachment, so you can uh, grind your own beans. You know what's happened? You We've run out of gadgets. So now they're just taking different gadgets and sticking them together. I think that's. I think there's a lot of that to be said. Well, like I got this new uh, microphone that prints documents. Yeah, I mean, it's, exactly. it's, it's, microphone it's, document printer. Right. Sure. Exactly. No, the Ember is is good, but it actually it's eighty dollars, so it's not it's not cheap. Oh, okay. I like okay. yours. Maybe twenty five is a little bit, or thirty is a little bit more reasonable. Y You'll yeah. find Dick and at gizwiz.biz and information about his coffee warmer. <laughs> and what it has to do with blueberries. Thank you, Dickie D. We'll talk next week. Okay, buddy. Take Actually, care. Actually, next Bye. week, Rich DeMuro will be here filling in for me from KTLA TV. So. So don't be surprised if somebody actually good-looking is interviewing you next week. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Rich is okay. I, I say that because once I said, oh, I like Rich, and you were very depressed. Yeah. He's okay. <laughs> don't like him too much, okay? <laughs> I will be back in a couple of weeks. Rich tomorrow taking over for the next uh, couple of uh, weekends, and then I will be back in uh, late September to continue on with the great tradition that has become the Tech Guy Show. <laughs> and so will Dickie D. Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. Bye. Uh, I'm going on vacation. I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great geek month. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech. And you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.